Hello and welcome to Shree's Sunday New York Times Read Along. Our guest this week is Lori White, president of the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce, Rhode Island's largest private sector business advocacy and economic development organization. Our host, of course, is Sri Srinivasan, Marshall Loeb Professor at the Stony Brook School of Journalism and co-founder of Digimentors, a digital and virtual events consultancy. My name is Neil Parekh, executive producer of the New York Times Read Along and vice president of events and communications at Digimentors. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Please like, Please share, please retweet, tell your friends, and have them join us. And now we will go to the Upper West Side cam to take a look at what uh, New York City looks like this morning. And of course, that's uh, Sri Srinivasan's, really off of Sri Srinivasan's uh, balcony. Without further ado, it's the Upper West Side cam. Shri, what are we looking at today? Good morning, everybody, and hello, Neil. We are looking at the Upper West Side. From the Upper West Side, you're seeing Midtown Manhattan. You're seeing the tops of the buildings cut off by the really low cloud cover today. Here is New Jersey across the Hudson River, and you're seeing a quiet Sunday morning. Fall Sundays are not this quiet, but during the pandemic, of course, you can see barely anyone on the roads today. And in the distance, you can see Central Park. And greetings to everyone watching. Tell us where you're watching from. Patricia's in New York. She's watching on LinkedIn. We're live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. We love getting your comments. Tell us where you're watching from. Jonathan's watching from the East Village, which is all the way over there somewhere. And uh, thank you all for being here. Hope you're having a good Sunday. Hope you're getting some time off. For those of our viewers in countries where Sundays are work days, welcome to the start of your week. And we have an early riser, Sri. Doug Levy, our friend from uh, uh, Cal Northern California, uh, watching yes. at 5.30 a.m. Eastern time, uh, which is- A local uh, time, 5.30 a.m. Pacific time. Sorry, 5.30 Pacific for him, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, he, he noted from there, he, he caught that the Gristides across the street has, uh, that's a grocery store has been torn down and a, uh, a high rise is coming up over there. There's a lot of noise from this construction work that's difficult to live across from, but that's New York. It keeps, you know, buildings keep coming up and things get torn down. And that's part of the charm of New York City. Dr. Chandrasekhar, Sajana yes. Chandrasekhar, host of She's On Call, which airs at 11 a.m. Eastern time with her co-host, of course, Dr. Marina Kurian, uh, informs us that the word of the day is laftivism from Nick Kristoff's op-ed. Um, as you often say, uh, Shri, if we uh, we have to laugh, otherwise we'd, we'd be crying uh, most days. Um, that, that is true, as I laugh as I say that, though I've never heard that term yet because I haven't gotten to it, so I look forward to reading that. And Patricia says, welcome back. That's right, I was, off the air last week, I took my first Sunday morning off since March and uh, was very grateful to Neil and company for putting that together. Neil interviewed his former boss, the U.S. president of United Way Worldwide, the form and she was terrific. Suzanne McCormick, great show, and Neil did a fabulous job as always. And uh, we were very grateful uh, for Suzanne's time and, of course, Neil and our production team. Uh, let's say hello to everyone. Just turn Absolutely. the camera around. Hi, folks. Uh, Hi, everyone. You, thank you for being here and thank you for your support of this show. Please tag your friends right now. They can watch us live or later. We'll talk about the news. We'll talk about the New York Times. And we will uh, talk ab about Laurie's work. Where it's so important uh, what we can learn from leadership, business leadership in one of our great states. So. Right. I, I want to follow up on Patricia's comment. Uh, we got someone else who thought I did really great last week, Shri. Um, hi, Mom. Thanks. Uh, Mom always watches uh, Sunday morning uh, from Hastings on Hudson, where where I grew up. So thank you. 
but we do also, I also want to um, acknowledge Janice uh, watching from an island. Uh, so thank you, Janice, for, for joining us today. Uh, our guest, of course, is Lori White, uh, who is the president of the Greater uh, Providence Chamber of Commerce. So we're looking forward to having her on the show in just a little bit. Uh, so real quickly, who else do we have? Uh, Mark Oppenheim, uh, Jim Tormey coming in from the Catskills, uh, Pradnya Haldapur joining us from uh, um, uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, near- Former guest. Former guest for Mother's Day, in fact. Um, and so with that, uh, before we get into the paper tree, I'd like to uh, take a moment to thank our team uh, as we uh, say hi to Eric, and Deborah as well. Um, we would not be able to put on the New York Times read along without the great uh, team that we have, the great um, uh, production team. So we have, uh, in addition to Sri and myself, Paula Kiger, you can follow her at Big Green Pen. Steve Taylor is at Steve DeReeve. Julia Weeks at Julia L. Weeks. And Carla Baranakis at Kabara. Uh, we have one of the things that's unique to our show uh, is that we have people sitting in Facebook. We have people sitting in LinkedIn, engaging with the audience, uh, providing links to articles, providing context. So many times I've seen big brands do live stream shows where they just set the camera up and point it at a an event, at a speech, at a panel discussion, and there's no one to provide context. So thank you, thank you, thank you to Paula, Steve, Julia, and Carla for all the work they do to help make this a great experience for all of our viewers. Um, and uh, as always, uh, you know, we really couldn't do it without their their support. Um, so Deborah is, uh, is uh, giving us a go team, which we appreciate it. Uh, Pradhan is asking, is it possible to tag folks on LinkedIn? Yes, if you mention people in your comments, uh, you should you can uh, bring them into the conversation, which is great. Patricia has a specific request, Shri, as you'd look at the overview of the paper. Uh, she wants to make sure we get to arts and leisure uh, because of the cover. So let's uh, let's do the overview of the paper, uh, Shri, and see what see what we have. And here's the arts and leisure cover is about the lost weekend with all of these really wonderful cultural institutions in New York, including Broadway, having been affected so badly by the pandemic. The Met Opera has announced that they are canceling the entire season this year, 2021, and that's very sad. The New York Times Kids section, once a month, they have that, and it's the comics issue, so we'll have some fun looking at that, graphic novels and more. There's also a special how to vote entire print section the fact that you need something like this tells you what complicated times we live in and explains also how the president is able to exploit the confusion and complicated times to make it more difficult for uh, folks. Uh, inside eBay's cockroach cult. I'm not sure what the story is, but looks very dramatic. And look at that artwork on the Sunday business cover. We also have here America is ungovernable is, and oh, that's what Frank Bruni says. And then look at this, America is, oh wait, America is, oh, both of them are America is ungovernable. <laughs> okay, I thought this was gonna be America is governable. This is Ross Douthat. So two New York Times op-ed columnists tackle the same topic, but from uh, the left and the right. Sunday styles, strangers, things in the growing online marketplace of people's intimate objects the items valued mo might surprise you. Okay, I'm not sure again what that is. Folks who have read that will comment and tell us because many of these stories have already run online. The at home section, we're making the most of the sunshine. Very little sunshine left in, in uh, the Northeast in the next few weeks as we head into winter. Regrets, too many to mention. There's a real estate cover about uh, lockdown time came up short for many New Yorkers. And uh, let's see here. The magazine has another beautiful cover. It's up, up and away from it all. The Voyages issue, a climb in the Tetons with Jimmy Chin, Conrad Anker, Savannah Cummins, and Manoa Ainu. We'll, I, we'll definitely talk about the uh, the cover of the magazine, Shree. The, uh, 
uh, the video is incredible uh, this week. Some great photography from that. And look forward to seeing that. And the man who uh, made, who ran Washington, this is about uh, James Baker, who was um, sec the, the Secretary of State and more in multiple administrations, the power broker referring, that's a referral, of course, to the amazing J um, Robert Caro book about Robert Moses, which is called The Power Broker. And uh, we are now, before we get to the front page, let's do our sponsor thank yous. Absolutely. And then we'll, and then we'll bring in Laurie White. So let's start with Muckrack, Shree. Greetings uh, to our friends at Muckrack. Uh, they uh, helped me put together this amazing free course that anyone can get. Uh, it's a two-hour course on social media. Enroll today, mrac.co slash social fundamentals of social media free course. And you can sign up and look at all these happy faces and people with their certificates, including somebody who printed it out. You can see not just online or on their phones, but I love the printed out certificate. It's free. It takes about two hours of work. You can do it in two hours or two days or two months. And in addition to uh, uh, Muckrack, of course, we also want to thank Strategy Focus Group. Um, we have two, you know, both of our uh, these uh, great uh, um, sponsors do a lot for us. Strategy Focus Group is a global team of human capital strategists committed to helping organizations solve people issues within your organization. They do that by working alongside you to solve your toughest problems and helping you capture your greatest opportunities. If you would like to learn more about uh, either of our sponsors, please follow the links at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll put them up in just a moment. Uh, you can uh, follow them to readalong.link slash muckrack, readalong.link slash strategy focused group. And if you're interested in being a sponsor, uh, please feel free to contact feel free to contact Sri Srinivasan, Sri at digimentors.group or contact me directly, Neil Parekh, neil at digimenters.group. And uh, with that, I think- Just one uh, more thing I would want please, to say Shreve. to everyone uh, before we start, um, the, the, our ability to bring this to you is because of our awesome production team. And we would love for uh, more sponsors to join us as we have this global community that meets every single week. So please do support us. And if you, if you know anyone who would like to explore those uh, opportunities, please let us know. Also, we, the team here is part of the production team at Digimentors, and we do events uh, every single week. We do multiple events every week uh, with incredible guests. And we do, uh, we, we've done events this summer for 50 people and 100,000 people. And somewhere in between is the size of your event, I'm sure. So if you know anyone who's working on a virtual event uh, who would like a talk show like this of their own or just has a conference they need help with, please ask them to talk to us. We can uh, geek out together on the, on the possibilities of really superior online events. Just last week, we did one event that had uh, the Dalai Lama, the LA mayor, uh, the head of the uh, WHO, as well as uh, the op our opera star Renee Fleming. So we can really operate globally and would love to talk to you about your event. So please email and get in touch with us. And of course, this week, uh, we're doing some big events, uh, Thursday and Friday, and then Monday and Tuesday, we have a series of events for uh, the UN Development uh, Program, uh, Nature for Life, hashtag Nature for Life. Uh, and we actually have a, uh, a big event coming up next week uh, for um, World Teachers Day. We will be on the air for 24 hours, uh, 9 p.m. on Sunday night to 9 p.m. Monday night. Uh, you certainly don't need to have a program that goes 24 hours. You can have a program that goes for one hour. We'd be more than happy to do either one for you. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I also I, I know Neil. You'll you'll do your best to stay awake the entire twenty four hours. That's how Neil rolls. I uh, want to show you a couple of other events that we have coming up that you will be interested in. Uh, this is a free event coming up on October tenth, which is a Saturday, one to four p.m. It's a South Asians 
voting. Uh, that's what what they see means. Um, and you 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 can see on the screen four Congress uh, f uh, represent congressional representatives who will be joining us along with great civil rights leader Vanita Gupta and others, and including some surprise guests. It's one to four on Saturday. So that's two Saturdays from now. Please tell your friends. This will you'll get a chance to attend and meet. It's iaimpact.org slash summit. The link is on the lower right of the screen. So please check out iaimpact.org slash summit. And on this, and then coming up this Friday is a wonderful workshop that our friend Mark Oppenheim, who's watching right now, has uh, put together for us with an all-star team of recruiters to talk about job hunting. So if you know anyone who's looking for work or thinking of looking for work, uh, please have them sign up. The link is on the bottom of your screen. You see on the right in orange, digimentors.link slash job search workshop. We'd love for you to tell your friends this is a great conversation and workshop. It's not just another webinar. It's two hours and really worth your time. So please tell your friends and family to sign up for this. Digimentors.link slash job search work workshop. You can take a screenshot if you prefer or take out your phone right now and uh, just grab this picture so that you can tell your friends. Absolutely. Um, so with that, uh, Shri, why don't we go ahead and bring in uh, our guest, Lori White. Hi, Lori. Mm -hmm. Hi, Shri. Hi, Neil. Hi, team. Great to be with you today. Great to have you, Laurie. We have been this summer done multiple projects together, including uh, conversations with Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Wu Dunn and with the uh, great Christian Amanpour. Uh, we should yes, tell we people have. how we ha how we happen to do those. Absolutely. So um, my late husband, Jim Terracani, was a nationally recognized a uh, television news reporter who actually uh, spent some time in home confinement because of his refusal to uh, reveal a source. And as a result of that, he became a champion for First Amendment rights, not just uh, here in New England, but uh, throughout the country. And he was honored to go and speak uh, on these issues at various universities and journalism schools around the country. So when my husband died last last year on uh, June 19th, he, um, in his memory, our family established a lecture series at the University of Rhode Island to point to issues around the First Amendment and why it's important to all of us to have a free press and a press uh, that is able to be, and as Christian says, uh, truthful, not neutral, and to be able to play a role in the future of our democracy and to ensure that uh, we are able to have um, a free press and news media that um, is able to reveal the truth, has access to information and is able to tell stories in a way that preserve our democracy and help all of our citizens understand what is happening in their government. So to help illustrate those points, um, we were very, very happy, Sri, weren't we, to be able to speak with uh, Nick Kristoff, who is Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and columnist uh, with the New York Times and others, in addition to his wife. And uh, we talked about some of the issues that they have covered as a team and how the First Amendment and their work in advancing freedom of the press issues has played around the world. And that was amazing. And we really enjoyed hearing from Nick and Cheryl. And then as a follow-up, we were able to talk with Christian Amanpour from CNN. And interestingly, Christian and Jim um, were former colleagues at NBC10 in Providence where Jim did all of his work as an investigative reporter. Well, that was uh, one of the highlights of my summer. So thank you for uh, making that possible. Let's tell everyone where you are today and tell us a little bit about your work at the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. Sure. So I am in Rhode Island. I'm 
uh, actually at my home this morning, and it's about 30 miles south of uh, Providence, which is the capital city of Rhode Island. And I have been the president of the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce for a number of years, since uh, 2005. And actually, I studied at the University of Rhode Island, have a journalism degree, and that's where I met my late husband, and that's where I developed an interest in uh, the profession of journalism and safeguarding it. Um, but um, for all of, uh, if anybody's listening and understand um, really the skills that one acquires when studying journalism and being able to assemble information and um, learn about things, you know, on a in a rapid way, and to be able to communicate and um, get those messages back out succinctly. Um, journalism is a, a really fundamental skill for most anything um, that you do later in life. So as president of the chamber, we work on lots of issues that impact business. Uh, we represent business interests and we help our small business community in particular succeed and to have the tools and the resources and the talent necessary within their own businesses um, to uh, help them advance and to grow and to prosper and to give back to our own community. So it's, um, it's a job that I, I love and I cherish. I have spent most of my career at the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce and um, have really fallen in love with the people and the work and the community and helping to make our local um, city and region a place where um, jobs can flourish, a place that's really desirable to live and work, and generally a place that has a great quality of life. So the Chamber of Commerce movement uh, has many tentacles to it, much like um, your discussion last week, Neil's discussion last week with the president of the United Way and the United Way and the Chamber have lots in common in that we are very devoted to growing our community and taking care of our people and ensuring um, that we have a healthy place to live. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lori. Before we move on, let's talk for a minute about how coronavirus has been handled in your state. Sure. Um, our governor, Governor Gina Raimondo, has been an amazing leader in Rhode Island. She has, um, has an amazing portfolio of contacts around the world. So she has been able to um, bring in resources from businesses and corporations and um, institutions uh, worldwide that have resources to be able to share with our community. Um, we have partnered with Microsoft and Salesforce and a variety of healthcare um, partners and institutions to make sure that we have resources for businesses to be able to work from home, to make sure that we have adequate amounts of PPE, personal protection equipment. Rhode Island leads the nation in testing, and Rhode Island is also a leader in the nation in terms of um, getting our economy back on track. So we have, according to um, a recent CNN um, um, survey and study that they did of the 50 states, was number two in terms of regaining all the jobs pre-pandemic. So uh, we have been hit, we were hit very hard, uh, much like you experienced back uh, in April. And I've, I have followed many of your programs and. We peaked um, just as they predicted around April 23rd. And um, we have been home um, since March, March 19th uh, to be exact. And from that point forward, um, um, the cases um, were predominantly, I would say, impacting elderly and those within congregate living settings. And together, Governor Raimondo with her uh, Department of Health Director, Dr. Nicole Alexander-Scott, uh, performed daily briefings. Um, and they continue to do daily briefings, uh, helping our Rhode Islanders to understand the magnitude of the virus and also to prescribe ways to stop the spread and to really educate um, all of us about ways in which inadvertently, even those that are asymptomatic, um, 
can inadvertently cause uh, continued outbreak. So after April 23rd, uh, where there was the peak, uh, we went into the summer season. The governor was very concerned that uh, by reopening the Rhode Island's economy, um, that people were going to become lax and feel as though the coronavirus perhaps was was ebbing, uh, but not to be the case. Uh, we were. She was very um, very particular about um, weddings and large gatherings and you know even beach beach going, if you will. So she limited attendance at the beaches and really has been a very strong vocal. Uh, nationally recognized leader in terms of um, keeping this virus at bay. So we've had a few spikes uh, since then, um, but generally speaking, uh, now what we're seeing, like many other places across the country are seeing, is that the return to college campuses um, has created a situation where um, students are infecting one another. And in fact, um, that was the case here in Rhode Island. So we are on a travel list right now, but we hope to be able to um, be off that list very soon. Uh, some of the cases within our college campuses um, get under control. So for those uh, not in America, tell us what a travel list is and what that means. It means uh, there are various states that say, okay, if you're coming from Rhode Island, you need to quarantine uh, for 14 days or have uh, a negative COVID test. Uh, before entering and um, returning, so we don't we don't want to see that. We don't want to have any travel restrictions. We want to be on the list where the number of cases uh, per thousand is under under that limit where um, the free flow across the borders uh, is permitted. So I'm I'm confident that we will get there. the The governor is confident that we will get there. We've only recently been added to that list. But again, it's, um, you know, we're seeing now a, an outbreak around, among younger people and targeting uh, the university communities. And in Rhode Island and specifically in Providence, we are a university community. We have 10 or 11 um, schools, um, Ivy League, prestigious research, public universities, uh, um, world-renowned design schools, uh, great liberal arts institutions. So we have many, many, many um, uh, college students that have come to Rhode Island, that come to Rhode Island and are either, um, you know, studying remotely now or it live, you know, in person. So many of our, our uh, schools, particularly the University of Rhode Island, with whom uh, we have always partnered, uh, Sri, uh, on various lecture series, like we talked about a few minutes ago, uh, but they have done an amazing job of bringing students back to campus and developing a protocol to keep everybody safe. So there's been there have been a few minor outbreaks, but uh, up to this point, um, very manageable. I'm glad to hear that uh, things are looking good, uh, especially because I know one of the problems is folks coming from out of state into places like Rhode Island and uh, those transplants from New York and elsewhere uh, creating their own havoc because uh, they come from states where they may be not used to the kind of protocols and rules that they have in other towns. I know there's an article today in the paper about chaos in Vermont where all these transplants come out and, uh, and kind of there's a lot of uh, chaos that results from these folks mm -hmm. moving in from the big cities coming into smaller places. Yes, uh, like overwhelming the healthcare institutions and in small places like Vermont that that story indicates is, you know, a lot of these places are, you know, very uniquely quintessential small New England where um, established protocols for this um, may, be, uh, may not be as refined as they might be in larger places. And also, smaller, you know, healthcare institutions, hospitals that are truly, truly um, smaller, you know, I'll say um, primary care hospitals, boutique type hospitals that are not really always um, prepared for a surge in patients. So I think that's for kind a of- For surge in New Yorkers, it looks like. Here's the article. I, f I see it on the front page of the Times. It says, uh, city folks flee the virus 
and the bears rejoice. Apparently, yeah. bears love it because New Yorkers not understanding what attracts bears dump things all over the place and other problems result in this. Right. I'm reading that. I, I read that earlier today. And um, yeah, you know, Rhode Island had some of those issues early on because we are um, the ocean state and our beaches are among the very best anywhere. And we uh, specifically in the past have done very aggressive tourism marketing to um, help our southern communities that are very tourism driven, uh, encouraging people to come to Rhode Island to visit our, our beaches and our world class restaurants. So there's, there's, um, there's definitely um, um, a great deal to appeal to people uh, who are interested in summer recreation and coming to Newport as an example, which is approximately a half an hour away from Providence. And so there's, there's really a great tourism um, base here. And there was a lot of concern, uh, candidly, at the beginning of the summer about, um, you know, people coming in from other places and um, not following the rules. The governor was very clear at one point she, um, um, she dispatched the National Guard to um, be on the border to um, screen people, make sure they understood, um, you know, what the rules were. So coming, you know, coming from the Connecticut, Rhode Island border, there was a lot of awareness building early on about um, the need to keep this very contained. So that was, you know, she didn't want to see another spike. And um, yeah, so th that whole thing is, is a very real thing. Plus, you know, what's interesting, Sri, and I know we've talked about this, um, real estate prices um, and the real estate market right now in, in very, you know, rural places and, um, you know, desirable suburban places, you know, skyrocketing, you know, really hot real estate, you know, people buying things sight unseen, getting, you know, um, sellers getting their full asking price and maybe even a premium. So there's definitely an exodus. Um, and certainly um, a fatigue maybe among certain people that they wanna, you know, just get away from it all and, and go someplace quiet and um, feed the bears, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's look at the, let's look at the news. Uh, and uh, folks, our guest is Lori White Tarakani. She is uh, the president of the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. And uh, it's so great to have her here. She's a dedicated, reader of news and consumer of news and uh, has deep journalism connections as you heard the wonderful legacy of her late husband jim tarakani uh, that uh, she is keeping alive through uh, the lecture series and other great work that they're doing at the university of rhode island all right so let's look at the paper and uh laurie will jump in as uh, she sees stories mm -hmm. uh, to comment on but otherwise i'm just going to get started the Trump pick for court opens dash to vote solidly conservative record on rulings as Amy Coney Barrett and, and for her a partisan battle awaits. Uh, this is her family. Uh, the court tilt will test Biden's appetite for hardball. You know, uh, this is one, one of the things that we'll be watching for is what happens in the next 40 something days. And in, in effect, the election has already started because of early voting that's already taking place. So when people say, oh, it's only 40 days away, there's a lot of voting that's going to happen between now and November 3rd. In Minneapolis, a quiet retreat from defund in Minneapolis. This was one of the words that was that caught fire this summer, but defund the police. But uh, what uh, most protesters and others were saying was, let's redirect resources from the police to certain areas and certain uh, institutions that can better handle things that the police should not. Uh, we hear in the background, uh, Lori reading the paper and that's awesome. That's the sound of the print newspaper. And this is one of the reasons why we do this show is that how much we love uh, getting the paper and, and flipping through it. It's so different. Uh, when, the, when you read it online, for example, this cover of the Sunday Review, they have uh, two uh, stories on one front page. Online, it will not look like this. 
And uh, so I love hearing the sound of, of, of newspapers. Uh, so one, one quick point about this is we had Trish Hall, the former opinion editor, uh, one of the, uh, the former opinion page editor of the New York Times. And we talked about the importance of words that you use and how different words uh, have different impact. And so uh, people are like President Trump were able to jump on the term defund police to make it sound like people are saying we don't want the police at all. And that was interesting. And by the way, speaking of the New York Times opinion page, we are going to have an epic series of, uh, of, uh, of uh, New York Times read-alongs to commemorate the uh, fifth anniversary of the New York Times read-along. And next week, we have a very special guest joining us. Andrew Rosenthal is former New York Times editorial page editor and current New York Times opinion columnist and podcast contributor. He'll be with us. In this photo, you see two people. Only one of us was born in New Delhi, and uh, that wasn't me. So we'll learn about that angle. Uh, his father, uh, Abe Rosenthal, the legendary Abe Rosenthal, was New York uh, Times correspondent in India when Andrew was born. So we'll talk about that and so much more with Andrew Rosenthal next Sunday, 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, please mark your calendars. And right now, please share this with your friends and family. And you can find our archives of all our shows on youtube.com slash Srenet, S-R-E-E-N-E-T. Hit that subscribe button. Or if you're on Facebook right now, please follow uh, me. Uh, also follow me on Twitter. And that way you'll always know when we're live, either with the live New York Times read along or the daily program, which we'll tell you about very quickly. Tonight, we have a New York Times reporter. One of the star reporters is joining us at 9 p.m. Eastern. Michael Schmidt will be with us. He is a reporter and his book is called Donald Trump versus the United States Inside the Struggle to Stop a President. That's 9 p.m. tonight. Please join us. It's the 201st episode of the New York Times of, of the Daily COVID program. And 9 p.m. you will get to meet Michael. He is awesome. He's an awesome reporter who broke many stories, including, by the way, the story that uh, got a lot of attention in the 2016 election, the story of the Clinton email servers. And oh, the, the story, of course, uh, had long legs beyond that and whether the story itself was overplayed and all of that is something to be debated but the story itself was broken by him he also broke the story of one of the videos of a one of the uh, folks who was killed in police violence shot in the back that video story was broken by michael he also helped break one of the big fifa stories of the fifa corruption so he's a terrific reporter you'll learn a lot from him and you can ask him anything tonight, Michael Schmidt, 9 p.m. Eastern. Okay, back to the this morning and the New York Times read along. Uh, China in vaccine wager gives unproven shot to thousands. And one of the things that been striking, and I tweeted about this this morning, that President Trump is pushing through vaccines uh, in the U.S. He's trying to make sure, just like in China, that they will be able to have the vaccine early, but every Trump person online says they will not take the vaccine no matter what. So why is he making things worse when um, there would there could be other ways in which uh, this could be approached? Uh, let's see here. On this day in history, Kelly and his wife seized in Memphis in 1933, a high profile gangster, George Machine Gun Kelly Barnes, was apprehended without incident in Memphis, Tennessee. This was a big story, obviously, back in 1933. And those of you who follow gangster lore know that story. All right, let's keep going. Tracking an outbreak, another kind of isolation on record-breaking hike. Philip Garcia is in a photo he took using a timer, has spent the summer trying to break a record for an obscure and extreme hiking challenge through all 650 trails of the White Mountains in New Hampshire. Let me ask Lori what kind of outdoors person, outdoors woman mm -hmm. she is. <laughs> well, uh, like we talked about, the um, the beaches are something that I love, and I enjoy um, going to the beach and being there to watch the sunrise, and then still being there to watch the sunset. 
really enjoy that. And um, I have only gone hiking in uh, in the mountains in New Hampshire just once or twice in my life. But um, um, I do, I can truly appreciate the skill that it's necessary to, um, and the athleticism that is necessary to be able to scale these peaks. So um, what he is doing is absolutely amazing. And, you know, you- 28 people, miles a day, by the way, 20 <laughs> walking yeah. basically or running or whatever jogging yeah. that he's doing. And uh, carrying all the gear and whatnot. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's an amazing, it's an amazing feat, but hey, everybody's trying to find new things. And, um, you know, we hear people say, well, you know, try to find a project that you want to tackle during this Corona period and, and work at it. And I hear you say that all the time, Sri, find something that you wanted to do and, and do it and accomplish something and use the time. So um, a lot of people are taking to the outdoors and, and tackling these athletic feats and, um, you know, feeling good of just about communing with nature, I guess. Lippy Roy is watching and Lippy, Dr. Lippy Roy was our very first guest on the daily show that we we do. She was also uh, a guest or, or, or on this show as we talked about coronavirus very early in March itself. Before the lockdown, we started talking about coronavirus on this show and uh, Lippy is watching and uh, she says self-quarantining is really important in Canada where that matters. I'm looking here on screen, I mean, on, on the newspaper with, there's a movie coming out about the Comey rule, it's called, it's about uh, the, um, about James Comey, the FBI director and Donald Trump, Brendan Gleeson plays him. You may recognize Brendan's face and whatever side you're on, you only know half the story. And uh, I am uh, looking forward to seeing this. Uh, are you a binge watcher of things? Are you a Netflix watcher? Not really. The only things I binge watch are your programs. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you're a reader no. then, is that, are you a yeah, reader? Yeah, you know or? what? Yeah, I enjoy, I enjoy reading, but um, on Netflix, I like um, shows about um, the chef's table. I don't know if you've ever seen that where it, they, sure, pro sure, yeah. yeah, they profile, um, you know, prominent chefs around the world and we take a sneak peek into their kitchens and watch them grow their own food and the like. So it's, it's a nice uh, respite from, you know, the chaotic stuff that we generally are treated to <laughs> during the 24 hour, 24 seven news cycle, particularly during the day. So yeah, I'd like to, I like to um, sort of binge on that. Yeah. Here we're looking at, uh, more stories about city folks flocking to small towns, buying up a hundred homes in one town in particular. And then pandemic steals another tradition. Remote learning means no more snow days. I remember when we used to get a rare snow day in New York, it was such a big deal when I was a kid and then for my kids. And uh, I think that's one of the big changes, uh, Laurie, you might agree, is that uh, remote learning, remote meetings, remote conferences, have uh, have shown that there are good aspects of them. Doesn't mean we want to mm -hmm. never go back in real life, but that mix, I think, is what we're going to see going forward. Yeah, the, that whole notion of snow day is very interesting. In Rhode Island, um, our kids have had a lot of snow days. Uh, traditionally, we are in um, traditionally having a lot of cold weather and snow and the like. And there's also, um, you know, a great deal of um, you know, anxiety around putting kids on school buses and having them, you know, wait in long lines in the cold. And there have been some um, very notorious incidents where, you know, kids got hurt. So in the the education class, it's always like, okay, we're gonna, we are going to err on the side of, you know, extreme caution. So we've had um, schools canceled for, you know, sometimes for, you know, two or three inches of snow, as it turns out. So I think that's interesting, Sri, that you said in the very rare times in New York City where your kids um, had a snow day. So we would be the polar opposite, if you will, <laughs> with uh, <laughs> the very rare times where we would go to school in a, in a, in a blizzard. But yeah, you know, you know, kids are saying, okay, well, you know, too much to their disappointment, I'm sure that instead of uh, getting a day to go out in the snow and make snowmen and, you know, go on the streets and, 
you know, just enjoy being outside or in the parks, et cetera, but they'll have to be back in front of their screens and doing their lessons. So that is an unfortunate uh, outgrowth from at least from the kids' perspective. Mark's, Mark, who's watching in North Carolina says, I used to love snow days and snow angels and snow ice cream as a kid. And Mark asks, does your guest have any books she would recommend as she's a fan of books since you're refusing to recommend too many Netflix shows? <laughs> Let's uh, tell us what you're reading or what you read this summer. Okay, well, you know what? Um, I didn't read it this summer, but I wanted to mention uh, when I was looking at the paper this morning, the power. when you mentioned The Power Broker, I immediately thought of The Power Broker book by Robert Caro, that tomb about Robert Moses. And I have to say, I saw somebody reading it on the beach uh, this summer where, um, you know, where I generally go to the beach. And I was so excited. I, I didn't even know him. I went up to him. I said, I see that you're reading my favorite book and he was a bit startled i said i just thought that was such an amazing piece and you referenced it um a few minutes ago uh sri about the power broker and the building of new york city and the parks and um and the you know you showed us the pictures of uh, new york city this morning and all along the hudson and just you know various things uh, that um, Robert Moses and his his team and the the legacy you know ups and downs of his career and the the way to which he was uh, truly um, a force to be reckoned with in some periods both for good and for um, you know perhaps other things known for other things but the idea that the um, the original roads along the Hudson were strategically and specifically built along the water because during that time with the advent of the automobile, right? So people were flocking to their automobiles and wanting to take beautiful rides. So of course you would put the, you know, the highway right next to the road. So that would not be the case today when, you know, the idea is to open up the, the waterways and open up the shores and bring, you know, the parks closer. Uh, in and in consolidating the roadways and rerouting them through other places, but there was just so much, um, so much fodder there in that book. Particularly, someone like me that enjoys um, reading about economic development and the way cities are built, the way recreational places are built. The, the and when I did, uh, when I do go to New York and I go down the Hudson. And I look at the parks and the, you know, the different green spaces where kids are playing basketball and the like. Um, I think back to what it must have been like in the days of Robert Moses and the birth of New York City and some of the, um, the activities and the shenanigans he was involved <laughs> in during, uh, during the course of his career. So um, it's a great recommendation, it, by the way, and we used to recommend it to every incoming journalist at Columbia Journalism School for about a dozen right? years. The, no the trouble was that it's such a big book, and so I am impressed that someone was reading it at the beach. They would have strong forearms to be able to read it, kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a beach chair. Uh, Paula Kiger, one of our producers, points out that on Audible, it's 66 hours long. So if you have a free credit on Audible. That might be <laughs> some, uh, a book worth getting. So really invest investment of your time. Let's keep going here. Let's see. It says, for mothers, the virus is only widening a gap at work. We are seeing here uh, one Brexit feat for Johnson, avo avoiding comparisons to his predecessor, Prime Minister May. A historic carousel may not be historic enough in Japan. This is a story I, I'm not familiar with. A star pupil, pupil inspires Canadians to study up on indigenous history, turning the spotlight on systemic racism and atonement. You know, in this country, every single member of the uh, Trump administration, senior person who's been asked about uh, systemic racism has said there is no such thing. And you see how Canada is different. Uh, one other way Canada is different, uh, in a, a couple of weeks ago, they had a day with zero deaths for the first time since March. America, in the meantime, uh, is having a, a thousand deaths a day. And uh, after hitting 60, 70,000 uh, cases a day in the early part of the crisis, 
We settled down to 40,000, but on Friday we had 50,000 new cases in America. Paris suspect says attacked, attack targeted paper, painful reminder of the Charlie Hebdo. There was a fresh set of stabbings this week. Uh, defying West, she defends hardline pro uh, policies. You, we know about the re-education camps, the concentration camps that are happening there. Race in Maine is all about Collins and Trump. And this is about uh, Senator Susan Collins, who uh, supported uh, in many, you know, folks like Brett Kavanaugh, the Supreme Court justice. And that's relevant because, of course, the Supreme Court nomination that's uh, come forward now. And Sarah Gideon is her opponent who uh, has a shot at running uh, at, at, at this race. It's not, you know, Susan Collins will be, the incumbents are very hard to defeat, especially Senate incumbents, but it'd be very interesting to watch. And most people don't know that Sarah Gideon's father is from India and uh, very interesting uh, uh, politician herself. She has a record of bipartisanship as a speaker of Maine's House of Representatives. Susan Collins has said on multiple times that she wants to support women, but then has gone against that in many of her judicial uh, support. She supported more than 180 Trump appointees to uh, various, judge, various judge levels. Plastic bans banned in New Jersey and paper too. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, this is a story by my friend Mihir Zaveri, who is the uh, president of the South Asian Journalists Association. So we have lots of New Jerseyans watching now. Tell us what the story is. I guess in stores they've banned plastic bags, but uh, not they don't offer you paper either, I guess. I uh, wonder what's, what that means and what that'll mean in New Jersey. In Rhode Island, are you allowed to have shopping bags made, made of plastic? Mm -hmm. No. Nope. Okay. So you folks nope. have you've, you've done taken care of that long yeah, before. Yeah, under so. certain circumstances you can. Um, and a notable exception is newspaper bags. So <laughs> when everybody gets their newspaper in their driveway, so they there is a carve out for newspapers, also a carve out for certain foods, um, you know, prepared foods and and the like. But generally speaking. Um, no, but I do find it somewhat ironic and people are, you know, pointing this out as well that, um, so the effort to really reduce the, the flow of plastics into our landfill, the, the virus and the, um, turning again to, you know, plastics and disposables as, as instead of, of, um, you know, utensils that are reusable, there's, you know, you, we've seen sort of the pendulum kind of shift the other way. And um, there's been a lot more plastic consumption or the pushing of plastic, which is, uh, which is a bit unfortunate, but um, not to be unexpected. Look at this nice comment here. Uh, Courtney says, I always enjoy the New York Times read along, but one with Rhode Island community champion, Lori White is even better. And Courtney is also a Rhode Island community champion. She's the president mm -hmm. Hi, Courtney. Of, of the United Way. As we know. <laughs> yeah. She's a neighbor. Yeah. Hi, Courtney. <laughs> All right. And and folks, please tag your friends. Please share this with your friends. Uh, they can watch right after we get off the air. Uh, you, they'll be if they don't watch it live. And look at this. We're hundred percent in for democracy. These are some big brands. Gap, which by the way has a new uh, uh, woman leader who happens to be uh, Indian American. Eventbrite, Estee Lauder, Best Buy, uh, Target. Uh, the NFL, Reddit, uh, Warby Parker, Zillow, and Snap, and SAP, uh, Levi Strauss, Deloitte, all of these folks have said it's time to take decisive action to empower voters, build trust in our elections, and support our communities. We invite you to join our civic alliance and commit to being 100% in for democracy. And that's the address. Join us at civil, civicalliance.com slash 100. So, so this is the state, even Tyson Chicken has to go in and say that they care about things like voting and building trust in our elections and supporting our communities because we have a very, very prominent voice in Washington that is against those things uh, directly and specifically against those things. And as the leader of a chamber of commerce, I wonder your reactions to seeing an ad like that. 
Well, people, uh, business professionals are um, realizing that it's it's definitely their responsibility to not only speak to their employees, but also to their customers to talk about and to educate them about the fundamentals of democracy. And many of us may take for granted that there's great understanding or awareness about what the constitution provides and all of the other freedoms and the bill of rights and the important documents um, that set our nation um, back, you know, back uh, in its founding. And that isn't always the case. And people take for granted that um, elections, um, elections are in the United States are dissimilar to what other places across the wor- across the world, where there are certain authoritarian authoritarian regimes, where democracy is not a fundamental right. Um, so hard to believe that in this day and age in the United States of America that um, those issues would would be called to question, but. Um, reinforcing the notion of the importance of voting and to push back on the notion that um, elections, in fact, even mail ballot elections um, can be fair and can be run uh, professionally and accurately. And the Secretary of State in Rhode Island, Secretary of State Nellie Gorbea has been an outspoken champion of that and has been very assertive in making sure people understand how they can vote either in person or through mail ballots and how um, the state is safeguarding the elections process. So Let's take a look take, at yeah, yeah. that though. Thank you. And so, so important uh, uh, that leaders like your, the people you mentioned are, are stepping up. I, I'm just looking at some of the comments here. Lippy Roy says, uh, Dr. Lippy Roy says, I discussed that exact point on the readout last night on MSNBC, zero COVID deaths in Canada versus thousand a day in the US. PM Trudeau follows the health officials. He wears a mask, not hard. This is what the, the tragedy of this, no matter what happens with the elections, when the story of this pandemic is written is that tens of thousands of deaths could have been saved if our president just wore a mask and told people to do that. Him, as well as specific governors in specific states, have blood on their hands. And multiple doctors have gone on TV, healthcare officials, pointing out the difference in how other countries have handled this. You don't have to compare yourself to tiny states uh, or tiny city states or tiny countries. Uh, You compare yourself to other developed countries and see the per capita response and the per capita pain that America is going through unprecedented and unparalleled in the world. And it's so tragic to see that. Uh, I also want to point out that uh, Deborah was commenting about the grocery bag story. And she says in Ireland, people bring boxes for their groceries. I guess they must all have cars because I can't imagine walking around with boxes. Uh, and uh, Paula's reminding everybody that we can find you on Twitter. Uh, you are on Twitter, LW, uh, uh, LW Prov Chamber is your underscore Prov Chamber is your Twitter handle. And the Providence Chamber of Commerce is online at Prov Chamber. So definitely uh, follow, uh, follow Laurie mm-hmm. and the Providence Chamber of Commerce. All right, let's take a look at what else is in the paper. In Colorado, a fiery political novice guns for a state in the US in, 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 in the US House. And she wasn't kidding about guns. Look at that. She wears a Glock holstered to her hip at all times. And there she is. And she represents rural Colorado, but among the places are uh, liberal enclaves like Aspen are part of the place that she represents. And imagine any country in the world where we have lawmakers strapping guns and publicly pushing for them, they would be, you know, the American media would cover them in a very different way, but this is the way it is in America now and not something that we are used to. Here's more about the defund police question and Trump attacks protests over a Rochester killing local Republican candidates divided on whether to back president's view. Everybody is backing the president if you're running for office because you're so scared of 
uh, when, when you run for office in the primaries, you're so scared of what Trump could do to you. But uh, we're hoping that more people will show some courage. Trump says court and Congress give him advantage if election is disputed. So he is pushing for an election dispute. Unbelievable to see a president do that. And that's the reality of the world we are in now. Democrats focus objections to Barrett in terms of policy, not character. Proud Boys converge on Portland as police keep violence as Bay, one of many American cities rocked by unrest. And the president blames uh, Antifa and Black Lives Matter when the folks who are making a lot of the real trouble are right-wing extremists, uh, terrible people who he supports and they support him. Uh, I'm a, a reader of Obits and Michael Lonsdale, 89 actor who played the Bond villain that you see here. Many of you will recognize him. He was in Moonraker and in other films. Lamont described him as an uh, actor from elsewhere who seemed to embody the human condition looking in from the outside. And Ang Rita, who scaled Everest 10 times, uh, has died. He started his mountaineering career as a porter or Sherpa when he was 15 and later became a guy. The Guinness Book record for climbing the world's highest peak without supplemental oxygen. Sports, uh, do you have sports teams you follow and want to talk mm -hmm. about? Well, sure. I love the Boston Red Sox, uh, big Boston Red Sox fan. My family has had season tickets for, you know, 50 years and our whole family really enjoys going and being part of it, but obviously not this year. And anyway, the Sox aren't doing so well uh, this year anyway, so we may not be missing too much action, but yeah, we love that. And uh, By the way, do, we do, love do season, uh, I'm just curious, do season... Uh, ticket holders get um, a refund or anything this year? Yes, 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 and yes. So we got um, three uh, three tranches of refunds. We have, um, you know, back in the day, 50 years ago, it wasn't like a super big deal to have season tickets. So as a result, my father has some premium seats. Uh, so the, the tickets are really expensive, as you might imagine, as all sporting you know, event tickets have become, you know, in this in this day and age around salaries and marketing and all that. So yes, um, we got three tranches of refunds. So that was amazingly lovely, <laughs> I have to say. We should point out that, uh, you, you know, your, your praise of the Red Sox will bring out our uh, producer, Neil Parikh's uh, yes. inner Yankee uh, fandom. And so he's asking a question on screen here. Uh, what was Jim Tarakani's favorite oh. theme? I, I okay. will even ask you myself, Shri, uh, as the voice of God. Lori, please explain to our readers <laughs> what uh, Jim's favorite team was. Uh, there is so much to like about Jim. He had such an incredible career, but he also, <laughs> what, was, what was his baseball allegiance? Okay, unequivocally, Neil, Jim was a New York Yankees fan. <laughs> and in fact, I have this incredibly slick New York Yankees uh, jacket in my closet, which uh, I bring out from time to time just to, um, you know, sort of aggravate my Red Sox friends. But yeah, he loved the he loved the Yankees and he has fond memories of going to Yankee Stadium with his dad as a young boy. And um and you know watching the yankees so it was always it's always an interesting rivalry at home where uh we would tease jim about how the red sox were going to in fact uh, annihilate the yankees every season but sometimes uh sometimes we were right sometimes we weren't but yeah he, uh, yeah he loved it so i will i will lend you my jacket at some point uh, <laughs> neil if uh you if you feel it's appropriate uh, aggravate oh. your your Red Sox fan friends, but make your Yankee fan friends very happy. Like Patricia Freudenberg, yes. for example, she is yeah. very happy to hear this news. So yay! Yeah, Patricia. well, my closets are loaded with baseball paraphernalia, so um, I can I can produce on demand for you, Neil. <laughs> you just let me know, and if you decide to be a Red Sox fan, I got a bunch of that stuff too. Uh, he's fainting in the back, so let's move on from this uh, very complicated topic. <laughs> Uh, let's uh, also point out that uh, we have a nice comment here from Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar, who says that her husband is hoarse from 
shouting about the ba- about basketball last night and watching. Uh, I guess the NBA playoffs are on. Uh, Dallas uh, Stars. Uh, wait, hockey. no, that's hockey. Sorry, hockey. that's hockey. Uh, overtime. Uh, yeah, uh, second overtime win last night. So uh, that's news from Sujana, and Sujana will be uh, joining us in. Uh, on she'll be on the air at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Let's show you this. This is mm-hmm. her show today at 11 a.m. She's on call that she hosts with Marina Korean, two surgeons. Uh, on one show with their doctor friends. They have an OBGYN and an infectious diseases doctor joining at 11 a.m. Eastern. I'm honored to be a co-executive producer off camera doing the work that Neil does. That's at 11 a.m. Eastern. Everyone, please follow She's On Call on Facebook and on Twitter and YouTube. And please find them, She's On Call, and follow these great doctors as well. Okay, let's take a look at the New York Times Magazine which I love looking at. And this is the Voyages issue, which is all about travel. So I'm curious to see how they handled this and what they did with uh, travel during the the crisis. But we're going to start by just looking at the magazine cover. We're looking at it physically, but on online, they always produce a really nice video. And this video also gives uh, a chance for Laurie to catch her breath and maybe share on, on social while we Look at this video of the cover of the magazine. Here we go. From the New York Times Magazine, this is behind the cover. This week is our biannual voyages issue where writers and photographers travel around the world and take readers with them. We reached out to Jimmy Chin, world famous mountain climber, photographer, and Academy Award winning film director. He was preparing to do a climb, which is called the Grand Traverse, a 17.9 mile journey across the peaks of the Tetons in Wyoming. Jimmy put together a group of climbers, Conrad Anker, Savannah Cummins, and Manoa Anu. They're intrepid, they're fearless, and the idea was to get them way up there, just having a moment of spiritual peace and contemplation. It's actually a solid storm. Yeah. They weren't able to make the full traverse because of weather conditions. Oh, yeah. As Jimmy put it, ultimately, the mountain decides. But they were able to get in a number of days of climbing and make some great pictures. When it came to picking the cover image, we got down immediately to two different photos. The one of Conrad was technically a very challenging picture to make but just having the unobstructed view of the beautiful sky allows the reader to feel like they're there. Yeah, we went with what we found to be the soul-stirring picture, where you're standing alone on the mountain and it's just you and the stars. We like the idea of having all the type at the top, even pushing the logo off the top of the cover to go along with the cover line up, up, and away from it all. We were initially drawn to the idea of making a cover that dealt with how people are really missing travel because travel is so restricted right now. But ultimately, we decided we would rather make a cover that would serve as a relief from the complicated, stressful news cycle that we're all immersed in every day. Hopefully, readers will have their own deeply personal experience communing with the mountain. I wondered if they thought about putting it at the bottom. And uh, we saw that they had one version of that as those multiple covers went by. I, I love how they've ended up with this and the logic of how they ended up with it is fascinating as well. And uh, you can see this is the uh, finding calm two miles above the din is this particular story that they're talking about. But uh, they have so many stories about travel and all of that mm-hmm. here. What are some of your favorite tips <laughs> that you've you've taken, Laurie? Um, well, I've enjoyed, um, we've, uh, my husband and I spent time in Florence, which we really enjoyed. We spent time in, um, you know, in the, in the city proper and then went out to the countryside to many of the vineyards. So that was, uh, that was probably our favorite trip. We did, um, we have been to Paris. We've been to uh, London multiple times. We've spent time in Montreal. Um, so we've, we've had the opportunity to um, travel to a a lot of nice places. And as president of the chamber, 
uh, there's always been um, reason or um, various events that have drawn me into uh, other places in this country. So when I was growing up, I had family that was dispersed. So we, um, we would drive everywhere. And I'm, I'm thrilled to say that I've probably been to three quarters of the states in the United States by car and as a child and just watching, you know, watching industry evolve. And, you, you know, I think back to like driving to Ohio and seeing the big tire manufacturing plants and, you know, the real industrial belt, you know, sort of, um, you know, go, you know, be present right before your eyes as the cars are, you know, traveling down the highway. So I saw, um, it, you know, it's interesting since I saw all kinds of industry, whether it's agriculture or, you know, very heavy industry or tourism places, uh, seeing it um, from a car. But you know what I wanted to mention to you, Sri? Did you, um, did you see the notion of, I believe it's the Japanese missing air travel so much that a very popular thing happening now in Japan is flights to nowhere, where people get on a plane and then the the airline brings you, you know, on some scenic destination, and then you turn around and you land at the same place. Um, I read that in the Times the other day. Did you uh, did you see yeah, that? Saw, and would, I, I would you that. ever be interested yeah. in that? Yeah, look at this flights going to nowhere. I I didn't realize it was only in uh, in Japan. And I guess other parts of Asia also, they're doing versions of this. I, I don't miss the, you know, I, I actually like being on a plane. You can get a lot of work done and concentrate if you are the kind of person who wants to do that or watch a movie or something like that. So, but I'm not enough to get on a plane to go nowhere. And that, that's not right. Cool. And I'm so worried about, you know, the vaccine and everything else that uh, I don't think I'll be on a plane for, for a while. Certainly not international flying. That's going to be almost impossible in my yeah. mind. And there's Royal Brunei Airlines flight to nowhere. Amazing. Uh, in the uh, in the magazine, the, this is one of the stories on the you, since you mentioned Italy on the trail of Caravaggio and what the artist, what an artist obsessed with evil can tell us about our own dark time is the branding here of the story. And here is Caravaggio painting. The places of Caravaggio's exile had all become significant flashpoints in the immigration crisis, which was not entirely a coincidence. So how hundreds of years uh, can affect what's happening uh, now as well. And here are more paintings. A painting made by someone in a distant country hundreds of years ago leaps out of the past to call you, to call you to attention in the present. So fascinating. I, I really want to read this. Uh, I, I love the work of Caravaggio, so seeing that will be very interesting. And um, are you a puzzler? The New York Times Magazine has lots of different kinds of puzzles. <laughs> I love the, uh, yes, I, I love the crosswords. Um, I do them on the beach, but I admittedly can only get halfway through it before it reaches the end of my intellectual capabilities. So <laughs> that's okay. But um yeah, just kind of keep it handy all week and you know you go back to it and say i know what i i know what that is but yeah. i try not to cheat i try not to look it up on the internet i try not to get the uh the the uh the crossword puzzle dictionary out but i noticed that the crossword puzzle dictionary is kind of of no use lately because puzzles today really rely on clues that are more um contemporary so the puzzle solving books that I have really don't help that much, but yeah, half is good enough. It's not you that the uh, one second. Um, we will now, now you can hear me. So, so Laurie, that was not on you. That was on. That was okay. On, on, I thought my AirPods had yeah, yeah. No, no, had sorry. Gone. <laughs> Our apologies for that. Uh, inside eBay's cockroach cult, this is the Sunday business cover. I know that, you know, uh, as somebody who leads a business organization, you will not want to comment on uh, mm -hmm. any, any businesses because they may be your members and all of that. But we're looking at uh, various business stories here. And uh, this is a story of the John Mackey is here, the 
health food enthusiast who espouses a high-minded version of capitalism, sold his upscale grocery chain to Amazon. He contends the sale has led to positive changes, and that's about Amazon buying Whole Foods. And uh, let's see here, uh, worn out bodies and little savings, laborers without assets in employer plans must retire without safety nets. Uh, more about eBay, uh, trials by fire. Uh, this is a, uh, a set of illustrations about what's happening in the West. And look at these classified ads still here. Uh, not as many, but there's, they still exist. Uh, let's go from here to the Sunday style section. And um, I hope someone has read the story already and can tell us what the heck this is. A growing int online marketplaces for people's intimate objects. Uh, and uh, I, I'm... I'm, I, maybe I don't want to read this and don't want to know what what uh, horrifying things are, are here. But let's uh, go inside and let's see uh, what is happening. Get, getting some help from a good laugh. Meme accounts use dark humor to comfort those struggling with addiction. And uh, let's see what else here. The, the Times yesterday had a big story about the future of fashion and how fashion will be at the high end luxury fashion will be affected by everything happening with COVID. And uh, here is a the modern love column, which I like reading. I, I have uh, remarked on this before, Laurie, the, the Jim and Laurie story is a beautiful love story uh, of um, a relationship and, and, uh, at, and the health issues you, he had at the end and how you were together. You've shared that with me on uh, on other shows that we have done together, and uh, how you've kept his legacy uh, all these years and uh, continue to do that. It's very beautiful. And thank you for sharing Jim and your story with the world. Uh, let's keep going here. All right, I'm going to come here now to the social cues column. This is the etiquette column in the paper, and I am going to read one of these out loud and uh, Laurie's going to respond. There's no right or wrong answer. This is only advice and uh, we'll just hear what she says. Okay. Um, no smoking zone. I live in a home, a town home community where every unit has a small patio. My next door neighbor steps onto my patio to smoke in front of my sliding glass door. I'm working remotely. So as I sit at a table, I see her standing there with a cigarette. In recent years, she has suffered from mental health issues and have tried to be supportive. How do I stop her from smoking on my patio? And uh, <laughs> let's see, Laurie, not, again, no pressure. Uh, just curious what you would do. Get rid of the ash can, probably something like that. But, um, you know, that sounds unconscionable to me. I mean, the, the notion that someone would go on someone else's property to to smoke uh, just seems beyond the pale, but um, you know, I don't know what mental health issues she's referring to, but uh, I mean, come on, just talk to her. Thank you, I think that's a good answer. Let's see what Philip Galanz has to say. Uh, by, ask, uh, by asking her nicely to smoke on her own patio, that's what exactly what you were referring to. I admire your sensitivity, but nearly one in five American adults lives with a mental illness. There's no reason to treat your neighbor as if she were spun sugar or unable to observe reasonable boundaries. So that was Philip's uh, suggestion. And I love the this column, it's called Social Cues. TikTok, WeChat, and the global web, uh, all kinds of things. One of the things that Republicans and conservatives want are companies to be left alone. And here you have the president directly uh, in, inserting himself uh, into uh, the, uh, global trade and sale and all of that just really difficult to understand. Who's famous mm -hmm. in America now? The most relevant type of American celebra celebrities, according to readers of the New York Times. Uh, number one, exceedingly popular academics online from Neil deGrasse Tyson to Roxanne Gate, sports tran transcending athletes, pop star protesters, pandemic palliatives, and politicians. And then the least relevant American celebrities, according to Times reporters, uh, sorry, readers, 
pandemic pariahs, Bachelor Nation, all the men in the Expendables and Fast Furious films, uh, Fast and Furious films, Survivor winners from old seasons, comics from cancel culture, and all our astrologers. I guess the astrologers are being blamed for not predicting everything uh, here. So I've not seen this. There must have been some kind of, of um, unscientific poll about fame that the New York Times ran. And it looks like they did. Mm -hmm. NYTimes.com slash fame. Uh, so someone wanted to have a big wedding online. And so they said holding the biggest, queerest wedding of the year and thousands of strangers RSVP. I guess if it's online, then uh, one thing you could do is expand the number of people who could uh, join. Ideas for a pandemic approve appropriate gift registry. I wonder if there's anything. Oh, air purifier here is uh, particularly <laughs> appropriate. I, 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 I see here. All right, let's go to the, uh, we only have, I can't believe an hour and a half has, has flown by here, Lori. It's such a great conversation. I want to just show you a couple of sections here, the arts and leisure. I, and uh, I want to tell people that the only time I've seen Lion King, which is one of the great shows in theater history, the only time I saw it was in Providence. And uh, it was so good, it completely blew me away. And I miss Broadway. Broadway is just over there, down, down, you know, about 40 blocks down mm -hmm. uh, over there. And uh, tell me the last time you got, you got to see a musical or a theater experience that you remember. Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be the re most recent one you saw. Uh, well, the most recent one, um, Let's see. I saw. I did see Hamilton in when it came to Providence. That was amazing. Um, the last time I was in New York City, um, I saw the Carol King production. Beautiful. That was amazing. Um, I saw that too. I've seen both of those. Yeah. Yep. And um, but just just to um, talk about what's happening in Providence, the our, we have a great Philharmonic. And they have determined this year they are going to be streaming concerts, uh, that their musicians are going to perform in a socially distanced manner. So we have a, a world-class Philharmonic, and um, I'm actually looking forward to watching the streaming performances and all the, you know, the front end and back end um, information. They're going to provide different insights into the musicians and their instruments and the like, and can enjoy it from your home as opposed to, you know, going there, which of course is is a lot of the fun anyway, to see other people and to, and to take in the acoustics of the beautiful venue that they perform in. Um, but that's how they've chosen to try to keep the music alive, if you will whereby our world-class uh, Trinity performing, uh, our theater, Trinity uh, Rep Theater, uh, will not be doing um, any performances this year, except for the Christmas Carol, and they'll do it in a, in a different sort of way, but two different approaches to um, the pandemic and the, the demise of the arts and entertainment scene, which is so, so, so devastating because we forget that the arts industry is a major employer as well. Thank you for telling, sharing that with us. So important. I'm um, looking through the arts and leisure section. It's a shock to relive the recent past uh, is the headline because of that Comey show that's airing uh, tonight. And uh, I will definitely be watching it. And the untold costs of a silenced city. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I look forward to seeing, look at these photographs of a quiet New York as Providence and other places depend on the arts. They're so important. And here is Sway. Kara Swisher is the host of Sway, a new opinion podcast about power. And no softball questions, no talking points, no easy interviews ever. Sway is her new podcast and Kara is amazing and a, an amazing journalist and fellow graduate of Columbia Journalism School. And uh, just really proud of all that uh, she has done. Look at all these empty stages. And I guess this is the back of a theater. This, oh, the backstage, look at that. All these different elements here. And you remember in the Carol King uh, show, they used a tiered uh, stage where they had, uh, you know, different levels so that people, you could, you could have like a balcony scene. Uh, and they did that very well. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, there's the Metropolitan Opera. As I said, the Met Opera has gone completely uh, um, dark for the year. And here's a mention of The Lion King. And mm -hmm. folks, if you're watching, tell us about your theater experiences and what you miss. And if you've mm -hmm. ever been to a Broadway show in New York, tell us about that too. A painter I, enjoy, I enjoyed Wicked. I Seeing that um, yeah. on the previous page reminded me that I that my husband and I did uh, enjoy it in New York City on Broadway. And uh, yeah, speaking of uh, my fellow uh, alumni, this is about Lenny Kravitz. He and I went to uh, the same public school in New York, PS6. Um, and I never met him and I'm sure he was, he, I, I presume he's younger than me. I turned 50 this year, but anyway, he has a new memoir out. Lenny Kravitz break down, breaks down his first 25 years. And mm -hmm. uh, I should tell our producers that we should uh, try to get him either for the New York Times read along or for our yeah. daily COVID show. There'd be fascinating conversation. And he actually performed on the beach in Narragansett a couple of years ago. He was oh, the guest no. of uh, a resident who lives along the beach and he came with his, his band. It was a beautiful summer's night. There were thousands of people that are sort of assembled on the beach and alongside the lawn of this, this beautiful home. And he was the featured guest. Uh, so every year this gentleman brings in a, you know, a marquee celebrity. So Lenny Kravitz is, loves Rhode Island and um, you can remind him of that if you uh, have a chance to <laughs> yeah, be able to sure. interview him. <laughs> yeah, sure. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll do that for sure. I'm not sure what this, I'm looking here at uh, this ad in the New York Times, Live Baby, uh, the bigger picture. It's bigger than black and white. It's a problem with the whole way of life. It can't change overnight. We got to start somewhere. We had done a hell of a year. I'm a make it count while I'm here. God is the only man I fear. And uh, maybe it's an album and maybe there's an artist I don't know. I'm just so out of touch with current music. But this is, uh, the only clue I have is that it's a Motown. Uh, Motown is one of the uh, logos at the bottom. Paula says, the last Broadway show I went to was in 2019, Waitress with Sarah Burrell. I'm sorry about the pronunciation. Uh, it was a Christmas gift from my family. How awesome. And uh, I'm mentioning my birthday. We had talked about uh, doing an epic New York Times read along for my birthday and that uh, Paula would come up from Tallahassee. And I invited uh, readers to join me for my 50th birthday. But uh, I mean, viewers of the read along. But unfortunately, we're going to have to have a Zoom party instead. Um, let's look at the co the kids issue has a comic section. So this is not the New York Times comics issues, the New York Times for Kids comics issue. And uh, as you can see, as promised, all comics uh, here. Uh, John Lewis and the Bridge He Crossed, Quarantining with a Ghost, It's Scary. Uh, so very nice. This is not the New York Times that I grew up with. So much color and so much inventiveness here. That's really, really cool. Um, also, uh, look at this, How to Vote in Person early voting by mail. Um, this is all about vote, voting and what's happening in the country and uh, the confusion uh, that's being caused um, in part by the president and or in a big way by the president. And I'll also say it shows you what kind of uh, uh, signatures are rejected. So that's that's important. So everyone should try to find this. And if you can get to a print, a print paper, buy the print paper so you can have this and share, uh, share it with your family. Uh, look at this, voting's never been more important. A hundred million people did not vote in 2016 who could have voted, did not. So uh, that's part of what we're going to see in the weeks ahead that can some of those 100,000 people, 100 million people be uh, motivated as we know very well, the margin of victory uh, in the electoral college really came down to 70,000 people in three states. So 100 million people versus 70,000 people. As Michelle Obama reminded us during the, uh, new, uh, during the uh, her speech at the Democratic National Convention, that in many precincts, it came down to two votes, the difference, two votes. So everyone who's listening now and everyone who's a friend of yours can 
uh, have an impact. If two more people vote, that can certainly help. Here's the power broker is the title of the review of the man who ran Washington, the life and life and times of James Baker by Samantha Power. And uh, Samantha, I believe, may have had at least one of the same jobs that uh, that was held by uh, by uh, Mr. Baker. Reed Hastings, the Netflix founder and co-executive, co-chief executive, whose news book is No Rules Rules. Uh, so he has a book out. So even people who are creating television have books out now. And uh, thrillers, uh, a review by Sarah Lyle, how Ronald Reagan rose and rose. The 1980 presidential election marked the triumph of American conservatism, Reagan Land by Rick Perlstein. I wonder if there are any lessons there and comparisons to Mr. Trump and his rise. Uh, let's see, The Truth is Marching On, John Lewis and the Power of Hope by John Meacham. Again, we're going to, oh, and it's reviewed by my friend Eric Foner, who was a professor, who has uh, retired as a professor at Columbia, but keeps writing incredible books about the Civil War and Reconstruction and uh, about slavery. Uh, lots to read here in the New York Times Book Review. We are running out of time, so we're going to go quickly here to the uh, back end of the New York Times Book Review here. They are suggesting literogy instead of emoji, literogy, I guess, uh, emoji for books, how you feel after you read books. The emoji, uh, you'll need to write your novel, not read your novel. So uh, I know one novel writer who I'm going to share that with. And uh, we're looking at the Times um, and uh, the bestseller list. So let me just pull that on here and take a look. Uh, Shadows of Death by J.D. Robb is the number one book in America. And Disloyal by Michael Cohen is the number one nonfiction book in America. And Bill O'Reilly has gone nowhere. There he is, Killing Crazy Horse. And um, Cast by Isabel Wilkerson is a book I definitely want to read. Okay, we are going to go very quickly to this unusual cover of the Sunday Review. America is ungovernable and America is ungovernable. Why Ross Douthat thinks our biggest problem isn't too much fighting, it's too little. Okay, and why Frank Bruni thinks Trump, who wrote Partisanship to Power, is now using it to drive America into the ground. Uh, have you read either of these yet? Mm. Um, no, I have not. But I am, but I was taken by the uh, the interesting cover display, the, the artfulness of it, so. Mm. If Biden wins, will Catholicism win too? And this is an interesting story about, uh, a, as as you know, Laurie, when JFK ran, there was great fear that he would be loyal to the Pope rather than to the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so he was he, too Catholic. Yeah, he was too Catholic. Uh, since then, we've had many Catholics on the ballot, as well as uh, you know, either vice president or president, and mm -hmm. other you know. Uh, but we've not had another Catholic president, mm -hmm. but we've had. We have multiple Catholics on the Supreme Court. And one of the things that's being used against Biden is that, uh, you know, whether he's a, he's a good Catholic or not, and that's from a president who has multiple times, on multiple occasions, uh, called uh, the Pope uh, a, a loser and disgraceful and said terrible things about him. So uh, this is where tr uh, Biden and company have to take the fight to Trump and company. I'm not a housewife, I'm a prepper. Uh, survivalism can be about homemaking and community resilience. The promise of unschooling and old school movement might help us deal with remote learning. I'm not familiar with unschooling, I certainly know homeschooling. Trump's truncated census, just so sad how many institutions have been completely turned upside down. Trump's messy divorce from New York and um, a, we New Yorkers know how much of a huckster he was and the role that he played uh, in saying things, uh, including, by the way, when the Twin Towers, which my previous owner of this apartment would tell us he could see from uh, this window uh, from the balcony, when it, the day it went down, he went on the air and said how he was uh, happy to have the tallest building in New York after the World Trade Center. It's not even true. But imagine saying that while it was still smoldering. And so what they've, what this 
Uh, what Damon Winter has done is placed a small cardboard cutout of President Trump at scenes around New York City before filming them. And that's what you see here. To beat Trump, mock him, and laughtivism is Nick Kristoff's piece. I have not read this yet, but it sounds like a good thing to look at. And Linda Greenhouse on the power of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's imagination. Mm -hmm. Big, big just, story. Go ahead. Speaking of Audible, uh, Paula mentioned uh, Audible, but I just downloaded the Notorious RBG. So I'll be uh, listening to that as I go about my day. But yeah, I love Audible. It's a uh, it's a way to get a lot of uh, a lot of reading in in a concentrated period of time. So yeah, here is a, uh, thank you. A brief guide to twenty first century blackface by Aisha Harris, a culture writer at uh, NPR's podcast uh, Pop Culture Happy Hour, and this is all these different people who have done uh, this in the twenty first century. But uh, on top of all of this, one of the things that I uh, uh, talk about is digital blackface and using black folks in, uh, they're disproportionately remember, uh, they disproportionately show up on online uh, gifts and on online memes. And so I never use a black person in those, uh, those videos, those short videos and, and uh, memes because uh, I consider it as do a lot of other people digital blackface. And it's very easy to avoid them, but people do them sometimes without knowing that background, but I encourage you not to do that. All right, uh, we are almost out of time. So I wanna come back to Lori and give her a chance to give us some final thoughts. What is she uh, working on the next few weeks? What is she thinking about? Uh, and any part of your story that you wanted to share today that we didn't get a chance, the paper was so absorbing and your commentary was so welcome. Yeah, so um, I guess the one of the things that um, jumped off the pages at me when I was looking at the Times this morning, um, not you know, it doesn't come across as profoundly as it does on the digital. Um, when you look at it in print, the, the you know the digital version, but the the um, the imagery and the symbols that you see around the nomination of Judge Barrett and the children and the flags and you know and those are the this, these are all battleground images that designed to set up, um, you know, a very, very polarizing view and continuing sort of, you know, bringing that message in. So what I what I wanted to point out is, um, and Sri, you as a as um, a digital expert and your journalism expertise and the work that you did at Columbia, but the the power of pictures and the power of pictures to create symbols and evoke emotion are something that's very much alive and that the political class on both sides uses use to convey messages and also uh, more importantly, stoke emotion. So I think that's, that's what we're seeing with the tableau that has been so visible over the weekend um, on both sides. So um, I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the power of imagery. multiple ways in which uh, we, there are so many ways in which we talk about photography and its impact on everything we're seeing and doing. And so I am always looking at how not just images, but the design, the display in print, online, in memes, in photography, uh, you know, in videos, all of that uh, helps sway people. And we're, we're seeing an onslaught of images one of the things that we all have to do is be better prepared and therefore be skeptical. When you see something that is problematic, I, I say if it's something's too good to be true or too bad to be true, uh, check it out because you uh, may be taken by uh, people who are trying to appeal to your, uh, your emotions. Uh, we saw that this week. Uh, there is an organization that uh, j uh, Judge uh, Coney Barrett is uh, uh, alleged to be a member of a charismatic organization, and uh, the uh, one of the things that went around the internet was that the uh, dystopian tale and TV series, A Handmaid's Tale, 
uh, was based on that particular group. Um, Ma Margaret Atwood, the author, has herself said that was a different group with a very similar name. One is called People of Praise, one is called People of Hope. Uh, there is a lot to call out um, uh, when you look at a judge uh, for the Supreme Court justice uh, position, but we should rely on facts and uh, make mm -hmm. sure that you don't contribute in whatever side your politics are uh, by because you see something that seems to play into your politics that you ur urgently share mm -hmm. it and it turns out to be wrong. So that that mm -hmm. that's something, well, before we go, we wanna look at a couple of the comments that has come in. Susan has explained to us what uh, what what um, unschooling is. I didn't, I wasn't familiar with that. Elementary and middle school, my, her son was. Child-led learning centers on what they're interested in can work well, but not always effective. If you had had that opportunity as a kid yourself, Laurie, what would you have wanted to learn in middle school and uh, mm -hmm. elementary? I can sort of understand like kindergarten and a couple of years, but all the way to middle school, I don't know if I would have learned anything but comic books and mm -hmm. history would have been my choices. What about you? Um, I was always interested in words, like vocabulary words. And I, I remember as a little girl having a box of vocabulary words, like a thousand words in a little tin, and I would display them on my bed and I would, I would, you know, be very obsessed with knowing every single word that was in the box. Uh, so uh, I've also heard that there's um, a great book about the writing of a dictionary and how dictionaries came about. It was uh, some friends had read it in a book club. So that appeals to me and, you know, the etymology of words, I think that's what I would like to, if uh, I were unschooling, I would, I would confine my days to, to that. <laughs> As Mark, sad as that sounds. No, I think that's that wonderful. <laughs> I, think, I, think that's, I think that's awesome. Mark says, love the painting behind you. So tell us about it. Yeah. Um, well, my husband and I, we um, visited with, um, with an art dealer. And he has an unusual way of um, procuring art. He buys, um, he buys the whole lot, if you will, of artists that he's interested in. And, and because he buys the whole lot, he's able to, you know, put... Uh, immediate cash in the pockets of these artists. So he had a beautiful barn and um, we just picked it because we thought it was very lively and lovely and engaging. And he, if you want to see some more, I'll Ooh. step out of the way here. Yeah. And nice. I've never seen the top of that painting. So let's pull back. Yeah, maybe you can just push the camera back a little bit. And there we go. Awesome. That looks great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, it's bec it's become my um, so I do a lot of this work three uh, with the chamber, and do a lot of video. So I keep that as my backdrop, and inevitably, uh, someone always comments on how lively it is. But um, thank you very much for look noticing. All comments. Yeah. Look at all these. I love the painting comments. I want to just pick out some of the other um, uh, comments that are coming in. Susan says. Um, uh, wait, uh, Stefan says all imagery needs to be thought about before being used and shared online. We all have a responsibility to do very seriously each and every time we tweet and post. And Stefan has a great show every Saturday that you can also see on, in his archives. Spin It Social is his social media handles. It's about photography and social media. So I encourage everybody to take a look at that. Uh, Rachel Cooper says years ago, I brought the Balinese music and dance troupe who are touring the USA. A to C Lion King, whose director Julie Taymor had studied shadow and mass theater in Indonesia back in the 70s. I didn't know that. And that's one of the elements that makes Lion King one of the top five theater experiences um, I've ever had. And I know many of you love that as well. Susan says, I'm a member of the Theater Development Fund and got to see so many amazing performances at a very reasonable price. I know they're streaming, but I miss in-person theater. Um, Laurie, anything else you'd like to share before mm -hmm. we let you go? Um, we are going to be working together, Sri, once again in a couple of weeks after um, after the um, the official Tuesday of Election Day mm -hmm. with the part three of the Terracani Lecture Series in conjunction with the University of Rhode Island. And we have entitled Lecture Three of our series, What the Heck Just Happened? 
So we are preparing for any eventuality. Uh, Sri, I believe that you coined uh, that phrase and that's really very apt. And we'll be chatting with um, some national, uh, nationally recognized journalists as well as some local journalists and former colleagues of Jim. And we'll be taking apart the election and looking at it from various angles. And we hope to answer the question, what the heck just happened? if there's an outcome. Yeah, if there is an outcome. Um, uh, Laurie, you must be awesome at the game Scrabble, says Patricia. <laughs> well, um, I enjoy that. You know, I'm sorry to report that I am a word nerd. <laughs> we love word nerds on the show, and uh, we love uh, hearing about the uh, about people who en en enjoy the word. Uh, before we go, just a reminder to everyone that we do this show every Sunday. Let's tell you about next week's guest. Uh, starting a chain of celebration around the fifth anniversary of this show, uh, we will have Andrew Rosenthal. Andy Rosenthal is the former New York Times editorial page editor and he's a current opinion columnist and podcast contributor and son of the legendary Abe Rosenthal. We'll talk about him, uh, his work. Uh, we'll talk about what it's like to run the opinion section, the polarizing opinion section of the New York Times, and some of his uh, former colleagues who are columnists. Now he's a columnist himself. And we will also try to understand what's going on uh, as we prepare for the elections uh, in advance of what the heck just happened. Well, maybe this next week's episode should be what the heck is happening as we get to the elections, five years of this. And then tonight, Michael Schmidt of the New York Times will be with us, best-selling author of Donald Trump versus the United States, Inside the Struggle to Stop a President, 9 p.m. Eastern. Please join us for the 201st episode of the Daily COVID Show, which uh, has, has featured Laurie, Laurie White as a, as a guest before. So Laurie, and then in uh, a few minutes, we will also at 11 a.m. Eastern, we will have She's On Call, where I'll take Neil's seat as executive producer and director and Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Korean will be with us uh, hosting their show. And they will have OB an OBGYN, Dr. Camille Clare, and Dr. Lillian Abo, an infectious diseases doctor, will be with us. So that will be a fantastic episode, 11 a.m. Eastern on uh, Facebook, She's On Call, Twitter, She's On Call, YouTube, She's On Call. Everybody, please check it out. And uh, Laurie, what are your plans for the rest of Sunday? Um, I think I'm going to spend some time outdoors just sort of, you know, picking through the leaves and, you know, getting some outdoor time as opposed to screen time. So nothing big, okay. just, just chilling. We love hearing that. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. And we'll let you get back to your day on Sunday. Thank you very much, Laurie. And thank Neil, uh, yeah, Neil uh, is putting on screen our uh, ads, uh, our sponsors. Um, Fundamentals of Social Media with my muckrack. Please, everyone, check out this show, mrac.co slash social. Free certification now available. And also, big thanks to our friend Ron Thomas and Strategy Focus Group for uh, his support. Uh, if you'd like to be a sponsor of this show, please email us, sri at digimentors.group and neil at digimentors.group. That might be the first time you've seen a dot .group address before. Big, big thanks to our production team that makes this all possible. We want to say hi to Neil and our executive producer and the team that puts this, makes this happen. Neil's our exec and uh, Paula Kiger at Big Green Pen, Taylor, Steve Taylor at Steve DeReeve, Julia Weeks at Julia L. Weeks and Car Carla Baranakis at Kabara. We also want to thank and uh, give attention to the local connection a fabulous newsletter that Carla puts together. It's from uh, uh, Montclair State, and the work that she does is to take big national stories and give local story ideas for journalists, reporters, students. It's a wonderful tool that I encourage everyone to subscribe to. Even if you're not a journalist, you'll learn a lot. bit.ly slash local news tips. bit.ly slash local news tips, please check that out. And once again, big thanks to Lori. She was fantastic. I learned a lot. And uh, Patricia says, uh, thanks for another awesome episode. May God bless all. Uh, we appreciate you, Patricia. And Apollo says, better late than never. Apollo is now in New Jersey. He was always watching from 
uh, Las Vegas, but we're glad to have him uh, here in New Jersey. And Apollo, looking forward to chatting with you and uh, and maybe going on a socially distant walk at some point when you're in Manhattan. Neil, and of course, for yeah. Apollo and anyone else who may have joined late, as soon as we finish the broadcast, uh, in just a moment, it'll be available to watch again on replay on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on YouTube at the same links. Uh, so you can go right back to the beginning and catch up on a great conversation with Lori White, uh, president of the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. And I'm proud to say a close friend of DigiMentors and both uh, Shri and myself, we've gotten, had a chance to do a number of projects with her, uh, with the chamber, uh, with the, the Tarakani Lecture Series. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have her on the show and be, just be around her, particularly since her husband was a Yankees fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we know how much that means to you. Neil, I want to remind folks that we have a couple of events that people will really want to see this Friday. We have a fantastic job search workshop, not a webinar, a workshop. You will learn so much. You will take away uh, uh, tips, ideas, skills that will help you. So if you know anyone who's a student who's looking for work, mid-career, early, late, it doesn't matter. Even if you're not looking for work, please check this out. Digimentors.link slash job search workshop. Take a photo of this so you can remember. Digimentors.link slash job search workshop. And big thanks to Marco Oppenheim who is putting that together. And also uh, two Saturdays from now, Impact Summit 2020 for anyone interested in the election. This is a South Asian flavor. There'll be four congressmen and women on the show and many surprise guests. Uh, it'll be fantastic three hours, uh, trailblazers, game changers, and pioneers. Please sign up and the address you can see on the lower right, iaimpact.org slash summit, iaimpact.org slash summit. And with that, I wanna say thank you to Lori White once again, and to thank you to Neil and Steve and Paula and Carla and Julia. And Mark says another splendid show. Thank you very much. Tag your friends so they can watch this later on their Sunday. And Diane says, looking forward to listening back to this episode. As Helm said, better late than never. Thanks very much, everybody. And join us next Saturday, sorry, next Sunday, 8.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern for Andy Rosenthal, former New York Times editorial page editor and current opinion columnist. It will be a fantastic show, just as today's was, and five years marking the five years of this show. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Have a great week.